Hello and welcome again to UCL Global Health. When we think of global health, we think of human diseases like HIV, tuberculosis, malaria. Uh, but of course, all of them have a component of our relationship with animals. And I'm joined today by Professor Richard Cott, who is a Professor of Wildlife Health at the Royal Veterinary College and of Emerging Infections. You think we, we neglect the whole animal dimension of global health at our peril? Yes, I, I think we need to remind people that we are animals and uh, we tend to think of ourselves as something very different. Um, but we have many close relatives in the animal kingdom and uh, we also share history with uh, a large number of these animals. The domesticated animals, for example, have come from our evolutionary process. Uh, we, we this is dogs from wolves and that right. kind of story. We identify these animals as, as companions and uh, as useful to us yeah. and to help us. Uh, and a lot of our wealth came through that route. And so they're a threat to us, but they're also a way of protecting us. So it's a double-edged sword, really. I think we, we evolved within a natural environment. So all our mechanisms for health are derived from that co-evolution. If we separate ourselves from the other animals and, and so on that we, we have shared the planet with, it is likely that our systems will kick up. Right. I mean, give, give some examples of what you're working on which has relevance perhaps to global human health as well from the wildlife perspective. Well, we look at um, wildlife as potential reservoirs mostly. Occasionally you'll have one that will spill an infection directly to humans. Um, a, a, a Ebola virus in the Congo uh, forest is an example. If somebody mm. hunts the animal and eats it, it might uh, be infected and, and then the human becomes infected. But most of the wildlife problems are to do with uh, material that comes from wildlife and usually gets amplified and changed within the human environment. Mm. So that might be in livestock, uh, for example. So bird flu was a classic example. Birds tolerate uh, influenza viruses very, very well uh, in the natural system. They're not pathogenic. Um, and it's only after spillage into the poultry system, chickens, big you know, populations of chickens and ducks, that you create these monster viruses, uh, which then spill back into humans and, and also into wildlife, a threat to wildlife. Mm. Now, tell me about this concept of One Health. People are saying, look, if you go out into many parts of the developing world, um, people are interested in their family health and their crop health, but they're also interested in their livestock health. And maybe we should be integrating our health services to supply all of their needs at one place. Is that, is that the concept? Yes, I, I think in the developing world, there's still a, a relationship between people and their environment. Uh, they're not all urbanized, in fact, you know, up to 80% are still living in rural conditions. Uh, so it's particularly relevant, One Health, to these communities because they rely on these animals, they're in close contact with these animals. So the cost of that is infectious diseases that transmit between them. In the developed environment, uh, UK for example, we hardly ever see an animal. People are so urbanized. Um, I don't think that's a good thing actually. We may have reduced some of the contact infections that one might uh, have acquired from animals, uh, but we've replaced that with other, other diseases um, through inactivity, obesity, you know, diabetes and mm. so on. So take, take a pick. Do you see that as a sort of major problem for urban dwellers? I mean, are we just all too remote from our environment? We, we see food that comes from supermarkets rather than farms. And do you think that's part of the stress of urban living? Um, Edward Wilson, the American biologist, wrote a whole book, I think, about what he called biophilia, the kind of love of nature that humans have, the pleasure people get from gardening, from walking in rural areas. And a lot of our children never experience that. Absolutely. What can we do about it? Yes, well, I, you know, in my own life, I had the privilege of living you know, most of my life in, in the African continent. And uh, there you had a habitat that hadn't changed since before the Ice Age. So <clears throat> it is changing now, but there are still elements there which are very enriching. So the diversity of animals, the, the pleasure you get from just simply being in mm. that sort of situation, I think is 
it's, it's given me great strength, great spiritual and, and, uh, and, and, and even social stre- you know, strength. Um, and I believe in these urban environments, the increase in mental health problems is partly a result of this divorce uh, with nature. Uh, nature is very, very rich, and it helps us to, to feel part of something. Um, so I think that's a, a big problem for us. Of course, can we all have a, a, a piece of nature? Well, actually, I think we can. I think even in, in a, a house in the middle of the city, if you make it possible for nature to develop, you know, through, mm. through a small uh, garden in, 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 on your roof space, or, you know, don't concrete over your driveway. I mean, give it, give it to nature yeah. and, and you'll get rich, rich rewards. So urban wildlife is, a, is something we should, should do. Final question. I can't let a professor from the Royal Vet College and Wildlife Health come and not ask. Um, the, the big mammals, the big five, all the, 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 the stuff we watch with David Attenborough and the like, uh, are we going to see these animals still in 50 years' time? Are you incredibly worried about loss of biodiversity, species loss, or do you think conservation measures are starting to get on top of this problem? No, the, the indicators, if you look at the data, uh, the effort to conserve is going up. So I think the interest and desire for this is increasing, and, and that's, that's very encouraging to see. But the data shows everything is continuing to decline. The large animals, the panda bears and so on, probably will survive in one, you know, one, one place or another. I worry much more about smaller things, uh, you know, a wide variety of, of birds and amphibians and small mammals and so on that we just simply don't know about. They are disappearing at a, an incredible rate of knots. So, um, and they are often very important ecologically. Yeah. So, you know, we could, we could perhaps live without the giant panda. Um, you know, it's, it's in a cul-de-sac in an evolutionary sense, so it probably was going to go extinct irrespective mm-hmm. Of modern society but there are many very important species bees uh, you know without bees where are we going to be mm-hmm. and the commonest cause of extinction is co-extinction correct yeah as soon as you lose one it makes the next more vulnerable and uh, we are also part of that system so every one we lose creates vulnerability for us richard thank you very much pleasure